Always a pleasure to come back to the Jacob Edwards Library. I've been coming here since the second grade, so it feels like a very familiar, very familiar place. And Margaret and the staff here have been very supportive uh, of me and my efforts here. I think this is maybe the sixth time or fifth or sixth time that I've come and talked here. Um, and uh, thanks to you folks for coming out tonight where I live. We've got snow up to here right now, so it was kind of nice to come down out of the hills and see, say, imagine spring here and in the, in the lowlands, the relative lowlands anyway. Well, I think it's safe to say that there's no country on earth that is so dear to the hearts of as many Americans as Ireland. Of course, many of us have uh, family ties, but then there's lots of other uh, attractions, you might say. Um, there is the uh, sheer beauty of the place, um, the people, their culture, their language, their literature, their music, their poetry. Um, and I think a lot of Americans feel a deep empathy towards the Irish people for the suffering, centuries really, of suffering that they have endured and a sense of optimism that finally now in the 21st century, Ireland and the Irish people are on the, uh, you know, an upward trajectory. Uh, my new book, Rose of Glencarry, a County Wicklow Mystery, is set in Ireland, but in the Ireland of today, not the Ireland of legend, not that place of leprechauns and uh, uh, pots of gold, and not the Ireland of the past that was such a sad uh, place, uh, but modern Ireland, which to my senses is a very upbeat, optimistic place, quite prosperous and progressive. And um, uh, so that's the uh, uh, setting in which my book um, is, is placed. And what I'll do tonight is I'll read to you a half a dozen excerpts from the book that will give you an idea about the setting and about the main characters and a little bit about the storylines, but not too much so that you'll be tempted to read the book. And I've got some copies for sale here, but there are some, the library has some, and the, the, the print copies are going to get into the libraries soon. I know several libraries have ordered them. Right now I don't think there are any in Western Mass, but there are certainly overdrive copies. Anyway, um, so uh, to start things off, um, I'll, um, I've assembled about three minutes of images of Ireland and of County Wicklow accompanied by some music um, that'll help us all to get into the right frame of mind. So sit back and uh, think, think Ireland. <laughs>
Now, if that doesn't tug at your heartstrings, I don't know what will. <laughs> Maybe I should apol apologize for using such a, uh, a tune as uh, um, Danny Boy or um, London Derry Air, but it's just so evocative, I couldn't, couldn't resist. And that's me on the piano. I was going to try to play, accompany myself on the penny whistle, but I've decided that my uh, talents on the penny whistle aren't quite ready for prime time yet. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so first as to setting, uh, let's look at the uh, setting for my book. It's County Wicklow, um, which is um, right here on the east coast of Ireland facing the Irish Sea. Uh, you can see the coast of Wales on a clear day. Dublin just to the north, County Wex Wexford to the south. Um, to give you a sense of scale, it's about half the size, half the area of um, Worcester County, but with a quarter of the population. So it's quite sparsely populated. The biggest town is Bray, and that's only 30,000 people. So um, the um, just back from the coastline, you have a band of lush pasture land, very rolling, um, and then the Wicklow Mountains rise. And to uh, the highest of them is Lugnaquilla at over 3,000 feet. And that's just oh, 15 miles perhaps from the coast. So there's a lot of, a lot of up there. <laughs> and then there's a band of uh, pasture land uh, west of the mountains as well. Now, Glencarry is a fictional town, but I imagine that it's situated somewhere in south central uh, County Wicklow. Um, and um, I hope that it uh, rings true as pretty typical of a small town in Ireland today. So um, here's a uh, quote from chapter 2 describing Glencarry. Wicklow is known as the Garden of Ireland. And if that is so, then Glencarry is the perennial border of Wicklow, every cottage yard bristling with color. Daffodils, iris, and violets in spring, poppies, roses, and foxglove in summer, asters, astilbes, and chrysanthemums in autumn. The village itself consists of a few dozen buildings of granite or slate along the high street, housing little shops, a pharmacy, a tailor, a grocer, a fish store, and at least a half dozen small restaurants, many of them featuring exotic foods from faraway lands. Spanned by a high stone bridge, the river Kerry runs through the village before winding its way toward the Irish Sea, barely six miles distant. At very high tide each month, you can tell the river is tidal from the sulfurous scent of briny seawater and decomposing sea detritus that hangs in the air. Surrounding Wicklow, um, uh, Glencarry, are pastures, mostly in sheep. Um, but some dairy cows and a few horses. And there are fields of barley and corn as well, each crop with its own signature color and texture to the discerning eye. Narrow lanes lined with foxglove and fuchsia um, diverge from the main thoroughfare up the hillsides between the stone walls, marking off the pasture land in a neat grid. And I'd say that was one of the biggest surprises to me the first time that I visited Ireland, was to see roadside weeds like fuchsia and foxglove that we would think of as being exotic uh, garden plants. Anyone comparing Glencarry today uh, with a century-old photograph must be struck by how few changes are evident. Of course, there are some new houses along the main roads and several large modern school buildings. The shops in the village now include an espresso stand, a day spa, and a computer shop. Uh, but far farm vehicles still rumble up and down the roads. Huge harvesters, combines, tractors pulling hay wains. Though nowadays such muscular vehicles must thread their way among Pri Priuses, Volkswagens, Skodas, and Hyundais. Now, Glencarry is a quiet place. When 21-year-old Karen McGurk greets one of his university friends, and you'll meet Karen in a moment, um, his university friend Brendan, who is visiting Glencarry for the first time, Brendan says, sweet little town you got here, mate. Wild nights around these parts, I bet. Carrie nods and smiles, like you wouldn't believe, Bren. Party, 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 dawn to dusk. 
and sometimes even after dark. <laughs> and therein lies a problem for Glen Carey and for all small towns in Ireland and elsewhere, and that is that many of its youth leave the town for larger, livelier places never to return. In Ireland, that exodus of young people for decades in the 20th century created a considerable drag on the economy. Well, in chapter one, uh, we meet Kerry McGurk. Um, and uh, he's the central character of the book. He's 21 years old and about to graduate from a Dublin University. And here's a brief description of him from chapter one. His eyes were dark, deep set, puppy-like, soulful puppy eyes, and his hair dark, dark brown and wavy, usually on the long, long side since he refused to pay Dublin prices for a haircut. He definitely was not the typical college lad who wanted only to mimic his male classmates. Carrie's look was all his own. There was no guise there, no pretense. Carrie McGurk never pretended to be anything he wasn't. So Carrie is about to graduate from a university uh, with dreams of a career in journalism, preferably in newspapers, although he fears that in this era of social networking, print journalism may be the dinosaur of career paths. Well, it's a Saturday evening in May and uh, he's meeting his friend and classmate Siobhan Sullivan at a Dublin pub. And here's a description of Siobhan from chapter one. Siobhan Sullivan was tall, brunette, with bright hazel eyes flecked with gold. She was American, like so many Americans she had Irish, although like so many Americans she had Irish roots. That is, if you count roots that are more than a century and a half old. She arrived in Dublin three years ago to attend Dublin City University. She and Carrie met at a party at the home of a mutual friend that first year, then ran into one another again and again around the DCU campus until they felt like old friends. So on this evening, Siobhan has news. She's been offered a job, she calls it a killer job, uh, working for a software company in uh, London. Carrie's astonished. London. You mean London, as in England, Buckingham Palace, Carnaby Street, that London? Yes, Carrie, says Siobhan, that London. Isn't it amazing? She could see a vague look in his eyes as if he was trying to take in and process this news. So Carrie offers a toast, slancha, to Siobhan's good fortune. Then Siobhan asks about Carrie's job search. Nothing, not even a nibble, explains Carrie. Siobhan reaches across the table, touching the back of his hand briefly. Something will break for you, mate. I'm sure of it. Carrie shrugs. Then Siobhan hesitates, biting her lip, as if unsure of about what she is about to say. Listen, Carr, I've been thinking about something. How about if you come to London, too? We could find a two-bedroom flat, and I'd cover the rent until you got a job, which you so will get in London, her face lit up. I mean, it's the business capital of the world, right? Carrie was momentarily speechless, gazing out of the window as he contemplated this idea, moving away from Ireland, his homeland, to one of the biggest cities in the world, and moving with Siobhan Sullivan, and sharing a flat with her, a flat that she was willing to pay for until he had a job, and even then, how much could he afford to chip in once he had a job, that hypothetical crap job, whatever it turned out to be. Listen, Karen, said Siobhan, and Carrie's saying to himself, uh-oh, red flag, her calling you Karen, his full name, prepare yourself, mate. She says, now don't think that because we'd be living together that well, you know, there'd be expectations. It'd just be an arrangement of convenience between two friends, right? Carrie no nodded. Oh yeah, sure, yeah, he said with a casual sh shrug. Right, of course, what else? Um, and therein lies uh, another conundrum for Carrie McGurk. Siobhan, he believes, sees him as just a friend, a mate. But Carrie is secretly of two minds on that question. But suddenly all of Carrie's plans are thrown into turmoil. A family crisis takes him back to Glen Carey, where he meets up with an old friend, Roisin O'Malley, Rosie, everybody calls her. Rosie's story has always been a sad one. An air of melancholy seems to drape around her like a shroud. And now it seems history is repeating itself. Her mother, Mary O'Malley, has disappeared. She warned Rosie that she planned to leave her abusive marriage. She promised her daughter she would be in touch, but it's been three weeks now. 
without a word from her mother, and Rosie is worried. So Carrie talks to her and she says, she told me a few days before she left that she was planning to leave soon. She didn't have to explain. I understood. I told her more than once she should go, but she stayed, mostly for me and for Buddy, her brother. She told me she couldn't say when she was leaving or where she was going that the less I knew, the better. She didn't want Pa thinking I had anything to do with it. Rosie sat down on the grassy slope and buried her face in her hands. Finally, she looked up at Carrie. But she promised me she'd keep in touch. She said she bought a mobile. Can you believe it? My ma with a mobile phone? I swear she's the lowest tech person in Ireland. Anyway, she promised me she would text me and arrange to meet. And she gave me a phone, one of those, what do you call them, prepays? She told me to hide it away so that Pa could never find it. She figured if he did, he'd find out where she was and come after her. Carrie said, she's really frightened of him, isn't he? She. Rosie nodded, biting her lip. None of this was exactly new to Carrie. Even back in their school days, he knew that Rosie's home life was fraught. Back then, Carrie was young and naive and never stopped to consider the possible meaning of all that. They had pretended all was well, all was, well, rosy. <laughs> but he was older now and wiser, and pretending was no longer an option. He knew too well what the word abuse meant about the awful reality behind that word, how it shattered lives and families. He reached out and took Rosie's arm. Their eyes met and locked. She knew what he was about to ask. Rosie, you've got to tell me, please. Has that man, has he ever hurt you in any way? Well, I'm not going to tell you what her answer was. <laughs> I'll let you read the, read the book. But Carrie offers um, some assistance, uh, along with the help of Del Samuels, who you'll hear a little bit more about in a moment. Del's a member of the Garda, the Irish National Police Service, and the two of them and Rosie will um, try to unravel the mystery of the disappearance of Mary O'Malley. Now, um, that mystery takes a sinister turn um, in a few chapters later, in chapter 4, uh, when a neighbor reports spotting Mary early on the day of her departure by the shores of Loch Beak, a remote lake a mile or so from Glen Carey. Now, County Wicklow has a lot of forests. Not, not all parts of Ireland do. In fact, I think it's got more forests than any other county in Ireland. Um, and this particular loch is deep in this forest, about a mile from the center of town, so it's quite remote. And um, so when this neighbor sees her there early one morning, she seems to be trying to reassure him that she's okay, but then he finds out that she's been gone, and he goes to Rosie and tells her. And now Rosie is very, very worried. They report it to the guard, and this is a scene from chapter four. A few hours later, Carrie was standing on the shores of Loch Beag. It was one of those times in his life when he felt as though he was standing apart from himself, from his life, hovering high above, watching events unfold like in an old-time newsreel. He wished he didn't have to be here to witness what was happening, but he couldn't walk away, not for Rosie's sake, nor for her mother's. Loch Beak had always been a place of wonder to him. The loch had been a frequent fishing trip destination for him with his father and brother, then later with his friends. He and Rosie had walked there a few times, just the two of them skimmed rocks, even kissed once, although it was a brief and furtive kiss for fear that unknown eyes might be watching. But now this place of wonder had suddenly been transformed into a scene of dread. A Garda in a wetsuit and cuba kit was a scuba kit, <laughs> was about to dive into the dark waters, perhaps to uncover the earthly remains of Mary O'Malley. At the same time, another officer with a search dog was circling the lock on a chance of picking up some scent, perhaps an article of clothing, anything that might offer a clue to what took place here. Well, I won't tell you what they found. You'll have to read the book to find out about that. But I will tell you that Carrie, Rosie, and Dell, this is only the beginning of a long, long search that takes them uh, around Ireland, to Dublin, to Roscommon, to G Galway. I worked very hard to get the language right in the book, um, and um, which was a bit of a challenge, but uh, great fun as well. Um, 
I strive to be true to the vocabulary, to the words and phrases that one hears in Ireland today. And I've included a glossary in the book of all the Irish words and expressions that are used. And by the way, I use Irish spellings, so color is C-O-L-O-U-R, and even Irish punctuation if you look carefully. And, um, um, oh, and curb, the curb, you know, on the, on the side of the road is K-E-R-B. And by the way, it's not the curb and the sidewalk, it's the curb and the footpath. Um, so there, some of this, uh, these uh, terms and expressions are rather humorous, and I've collected a few here. For instance, beaker, you might think of a beaker as a um, glass or a mug, and it can be, but at one point Rosie gets angry at Carrie and she says, get your beaker out of my business. <laughs> so it can mean nose as well. And you might be able to figure out what boke means because she says later on, I was so sick, I thought I was going to boke. <laughs> I like donkey's years. <laughs> it's an expression that refers to anything as long as the ears of a donkey. Donkey's years, actually, for a time as long as a, don a donkey's ears. Um, so um, Rosie tells um, Carrie that she thinks one day he'll be a he'll run for county council and he says yeah that'll happen Rosie in donkey's years. Now footy is a general term for football in Ireland although there's two kinds of football in Ireland right there's soccer and there's Gaelic football and by the way the Irish call soccer soccer right? <laughs> they, they couldn't call it football because football is Gaelic football to the Irish right so um, and um, the, every kid in Ireland grows up playing footy either Gaelic football or soccer. And so at one point, Kerry says, yeah, well, we did love our footy back then, so. Now, a leaving certificate, maybe you can guess what a leaving certificate is. Um, it's a, um, um, basically like a high school diploma, um, although I think they might get it after grade 11, perhaps, approximately. Um, and anyway, so we learn that Dell received his leaving certificate, earning special recognition for his accomplishments in computers and technology. One of my favorite words is schmazzle. You might be able to guess what that means when Kerry says uh, to his friends before a friendly uh, football match, this is just a friendly match, mates. No rows, no schmazzles here. <laughs> so, uh, and they have a a match with a group of friends from the, the town. There's also a number of Irish terms. Again, these are all in the glossary, but Bus Aeron is the national bus uh, service. Kamogi Kamo is the uh, sort of the equivalent of uh, field hockey here. Kalasti means uh, secondary school. Garda is the police force. Gwelga is Gaelic. And Slancha, of course, means cheers. Now, this young Irish lad here has, as my mother would have said, the map of Ireland written all across his face. Uh, and so let's give uh, a minute to uh, hear Swallowtail Jig played by Kate Adelson as we see pictures of the Irish people at play. <laughs> That last picture brings up an important point about Ireland today, and is this th the diversity it might be surprising to some people. It a little bit, was a little bit surprising to me the first time I visited there. The, the diversity of racial, 
ethnic um, you know, clothing language diversity that you see on the streets of the cities and even in the small towns. I observe this in Bray and in Wicklow as well. And it's partly tourists, of course, but it's also um, the general population. I saw several school groups where there were kids of all colors. And um, so um, it's uh, an attribute of modern day Ireland that we might not be aware of. Um, and it comes about not by accident. Um, the resident population of Ireland is increasingly diverse. In fact, Ireland has welcomed immigrants, including refugees from Afghanistan, Syria, and Ukraine in the last two decades. And today, 17% of the permanent residents of Ireland are um, recent immigrants. And that's the seventh highest percentage of all the EU nations, of all 38 EU nations. So it's a surprisingly diverse place today. Well, Glencarry has a pub. No surprise there, right? And on a weeknight in July, Carrie and two of his classmates, Sean and Brendan from Dublin, are seated at a table at Finney's. This is the night before that football match. And Del Samuels has joined them. Now, Del was one of Carrie's friends from, in Glen Carey um, in secondary school. His family came to Dublin from Jamaica. A lot of Jamaicans immigrated to um, to. Um, uh, Ireland in the 20th century, shortly after he was born, then moved to Glencarry where his father got a job in a factory in Arklo. Dell also attended Colasti Guayuga, where Rosie and um, Kerry went, one of the few black students in the school at the time. Kerry, was, Kerry always got a hoot out of hearing Dell speak Irish with a Jamaican accent. Dell has a deep, resonant voice, sounding for all the world like James Earl Jones, and used to enjoy regaling his classmates with his spot-on impression of Darth Vader, Luke, I am your father. <laughs> So while the four are raising a glass, Dell is entertaining Sean and Brendan with stories about Glenn Carey and about his friend Carey, particularly about Carey's love life or his futile attempts at a love life. Meanwhile, the crowd is growing. So the lights have been, this is from chapter 12, the lights have been set up on the small stage at one end of the room and several lo uh, local musicians were tuning up a fiddle, a penny whistle, and an electric guitar. There was a microphone and the usual tap, 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 test and test and test and. Finally, Liam Finney, the pro proprietor, stepped up to the mic. Welcome, ladies, gents, to our weekly talent night. We got our usual house band here, Seamus, Bart, and Mike. You all know them. And we got some good listening for you this eve. I promise you that, including a few surprises. And for the next hour or so, the audience was entertained with all manner of amateur talent, with the emphasis clearly on amateur. There was a grammar school fiddler in training, a couple of cringe-worthy vocalists, and a 15-year-old accordionist who played Lady of Spain like it had never been played before, and hopefully never again. But then there were three young lasses from Ogram who did themselves proud, channeling the Dixie Chicks, first with Cowboy Take Me Away, then with Long Time Gone, and they nearly brought the roof down with their final number, a soulful rendition of Landslide. They were good, really good, setting a high bar for anyone who had the misfortune to follow. So Clark, uh, Carrie was stunned to see Rosie step out of the shadows and up to the microphone next, wearing a plaid kilt and a lacy cream white blouse. She looked out briefly on her audience with that shy smile of hers, and for one brief moment her gaze met Carrie's. The fiddle began to play softly and sweetly, and Rosie began to sing. I once loved a boy, just a bold Irish boy, who would come and would go at my request. And this bold Irish boy was my pride and my joy, and I built him a bower in my breast. But this girl who has taken my bonny, bonny boy, let her make of him all that she can. And whether he loves me or loves me not, I will walk with my love now and then. When Rosie finished, the crowd jumped to their feet, shouting and cheering their appreciation. Dell looked at Carrie. Oh my God, Carr, were you listening? Did that not pierce your very soul, lad? Then he turned to Sean and Brendan. Rosie and Carrie go back forever, boys, and I mean forever. So believe me when I tell you that sweet serenade you just heard, it was sung for the benefit of young Kieran here. It so was. Carrie shook his head. You've put away too many pints, Dell. That's just an old Irish poem set to music, is all. Folk been reciting those words for centuries. But Dell was not having it. 
No one ever sang, I will walk with my love like that before, mate. Never. Like I said, boys, he's got sweetie pies ever, everywhere, but he's like a bad estate agent. He can never close a deal. Brendan and Karen roared at that, but Carrie was not amused. Dell went on, what this boy needs is a matchmaker. Someone to, you know, speak for him, match him up. Carrie turned to Brendan and Sean, smiling from ear to ear as he anticipated his hum comeback line. Yeah, Dell, well, here's a match for you, dude. Your lips and my arse. <laughs> so the, there's a little bit of tension there between Carrie and, and uh, Dell that actually spills over several days after that. In general, they're good friends, but Dell does like to tease uh, Carrie a good bit. Well, there's no place holier in Ireland than uh, Glendalough in County Wicklow. St. Kevin established a monastery there in the 5th century, and visitors still flock to this wild mountain retreat for its natural beauty as well as its spiritual importance. And in chapter 6, Carrie and his mother, Catherine McGurk, visit Glendalough. So this is from chapter 6. On their return ramble, they walked through the ruins of the Glendalough monastic site. As they stood looking at St. Kevin's cross on the right there, Catherine dared to raise what she suspected was a sensitive issue with her son. Car, have you not been going to Mass these days above in Dublin? Carrie groaned, no ma, I haven't, not in two years anyway. She stopped and turned to him, why ever not? Well, to be honest, I guess I'd have to say I lost my faith. Carrie, dear, God loves you so. Surely you believe that. I didn't say I lost my faith in God, replied Carrie. His mother looked, looked perplexed. It's the church, Ma. I lost my faith in the church. Now, I realize that the, it is a source of great pain to... Um, to many folks, but the simple truth is that Ireland, that once most devout, most religious of all European countries, where just a generation or so ago, 90% plus of the population attended Mass weekly, Ireland is today a largely <coughs> secular land. Only about one in five young adults in Ireland today attend Mass regularly. It was always the belief of the Roman Catholic Church that the, in Ireland and the freely elected government of, of 20th century Ireland that the greatest threat to that nation's faith was external, the polluting influence of the outside world. That's why the church and the state sought for so long to keep Ireland isolated economically and culturally. But the sad fact is that what ultimately undermined the faith of so many Irish was not the influence of the outside world, it was the church itself. The Roman Catholic Church, its hierarchy, its clergy, really and truly have no one to blame but themselves for its decline in Ireland. And of course, among the key factors in that are the appalling sexual abuse that we know all about, the equally appalling mistreatment of young unmarried mothers, and the attempts of the church to shut out the world through censorship. And what astounded me to learn about was how the, that freely elected government for, for decades conspired with the church to cover up much of this. There was widespread financial crimes as well on the part of the church and on the part of government officials. Graft, theft, outright theft. Now none of this is central to Rose of Glen Carey, but it serves as important background in the development of the characters and the story. And I'll show you one more short scene um, the, to exemplify this. While everyone is focused on locating Mary O'Malley, another crisis confronts Glen Carey. A monster mall is proposed for some pasture land on the east side of town, and many of Glen Carey's elders are alarmed that it may change the rural character of the town and destroy the downtown economy. Carey's mother, Catherine, and a friend, businesswoman Gloria Hennessy, lead an effort to fight the development, and they recruit Carey to assist them. Well, I won't tell you how that story unfolds and how it ultimately connects to Mary O'Malley's story, but it does eventually. But near the end of the book, Gloria and Catherine reflect on how Glen Carey and Ireland have changed in their lifetimes. So in chapter 18, Gloria Hennessy says to Carey, You and your generation, young man, you give us old folks hope because most of us have been around long enough to remember darker times in Ireland, times when we allowed ourselves to be bullied and cowed by those in authority. 
we learned a sad lesson, a lesson I hope and pray Ireland never forgets. And you and your generation, you give us hope. So I won't pretend to be an expert on what goes on in the hearts and minds of the people of Ireland today. I'll just say that um, I sense that there is a new sense of optimism, a belief that um, peace at last has been achieved in the North, although it sometimes is a little shaky, that prosperity is enjoyed by the vast majority of the Irish people today, and most importantly that people have a sense of pride in their country um, and a sense of optimism about what they uh, have achieved so far in the 21st century. And um, as the seagull flies off across the Irish Sea, I have to say that Rose of Glen Carey is a, uh, a mystery and a romance, but uh, I hope in some small way it's also kind of a celebration of Ireland and the Irish people, a depiction of life today uh, that I hope is somewhat accurate. Um, the book is um, Rose of Glen Carey, A County Wicklow Mystery. You might get a sense from that that others are planned, and they are, but who can see tomorrow? Huh? Um, it's uh, um, available in paperback and in three different ebook formats. Um, you can buy it at the usual major you know, retailer, online retailers, but I always urge my readers to start with your local independent bookstore. And I know that Deb Horan over at, um, in Webster at the uh, Book Lovers Gourmet has all of my books. I'm not sure she has Rose of Lynn Carey yet, but um, if you asked her, she could get it. And the same goes for any other independent bookstore. You ask them, they can get it. And I don't know if you know about IndieBound.org, but it's a great, great resource Instead of going and searching for books on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, go and look on IndieBound, and not only will they tell, show you most of the same books, but they'll show you what local bookstore has it, what independent bookstore has it, and you can even order it right online. So the profits go to Book Lovers Gourmet or whatever other bookshop, rather than to the big, the big. Uh, places. Um, and one thing I would beg of you is if you read it and you enjoy it, please rate it um, or um, review it um, on either Amazon.com or um, Goodreads because those have a great deal of influence on uh, readers' taste these days, um, I find. Um, and uh, then there's uh, my Trolley Day series that most of you are already familiar with, historical novels set in the Connecticut Valley in the 19-teens that have a lot of Southbridge connections. Um, so yeah, I forgot to mention back on the uh, previous screen there that this uh, my website for these books will be wicklowmysteries.com and for Trolley Days it's trolleydays.net. Somebody else got trolleydays.com before me, so. <laughs> and now they'd like to sell it to me for like $1,000, but I think I'll stick with it on that. <laughs> and uh, that's the most recent of them, Darkest Before Dawn, that just came out about a, a year ago. Um, and uh, most of these are available in the CW Myers system, multiple copies. Uh, but um, Rose of Glen Carey, so far it's only available as an ebook, as a, an overdrive uh, through the uh, CW Mars, but there are others on our order, I know, and so within the next few weeks you'll probably see hard copies on that, on that as well. And of course you're probably familiar with my book on Edward Hitchcock that I spoke about here last September, All the Light Here Comes From Above, uh, The Life and Legacy of Edward Hitchcock. What influenced me to write a book set in Ireland? Well, ever since uh, I'd say my college days, I've had an interest in Ireland. I do have family ties, although like Siobhan Sullivan's, my ties go back 150 years, so it's not quite like someone, someone whose mother came from Ireland, as the song says. Uh, so I do have those family ties, and I just learned a few years ago about this, this uh, harrowing trip that my great-great-grandmother, whose name, by the way, was Hannah McGurk, uh, made 
from Liverpool to Boston with her four little children, one of whom is my great grandmother. And she, believe it or not, lived in Southbridge and died in Southbridge in about 1910 or 1912. So there's that connection. Um, but I always, uh, in college, I remember I had a spell of reading books about Ireland. Um, and then more recently, I loved the um, Patrick Taylor series, the Irish Country Doctors series. is 14, I think, in that series now, and they're just wonderful. The characters in those are just, just superb. And um, also, I like Sheila Connolly's books that are the Cork, um, um, County Cork Mysteries. In fact, that idea, she gave me the idea for the County Wicklow Mysteries. So those, those things probably influenced me a lot. And I have to confess that Ballycus Angel, the TV, the PBS TV series really got me started on County Wicklow because I saw all this beautiful scenery and I had no idea where this was. And you know, if you know where, if you look hard enough, you can find out where these things are filmed. And I discovered that was filmed in, in uh, County Wicklow. So anyway, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And the crowds go wild. <laughs>